Hello and welcome to Ivy House. My name's Tim Hewitt. It's great to see you all today. But what I'd like to do now is to introduce you to our Ivy House founder and creative director, Elka Edwards. You made me sound like a rock star, Tim, which I've got to say I quite like. Good afternoon, everyone. It's um, really lovely to be here with you. So I saw a lot of familiar faces there and a lot of faces that I've never met before. So for those of you that I don't know, my name is Elka Edwards. I've spent um, maybe 20 years of my career, maybe probably a bit more now, working with senior leaders across pretty much every sector. And it's been incredible. I mean, truly incredible. We were working with the individuals, with the teams, and helping them obviously become the best leaders they could become, but also live the best lives that they wanted to. But I, once I was doing that, I learned one thing. I only learned one thing. I learned one thing that changed my life and in fact changed the lives of the people I was working with. What I learned was that there are a set of skills and knowledge that when mastered, make a game changing difference to how your life turns out. And having learned this, one thing kept bugging me. Why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? And why are these skills only available to a tiny, tiny percentage of the most senior leaders? And why are we taking them to people at the beginning of their careers or earlier on in their careers when those skills can really make a difference? So having, having realized this, um, I changed my life. We sold our company and we started Ivy House. So we still work with a range of amazing companies. And they send people on our programs for emerging leaders, for graduates, apprenticeships. We work with people who are starting out. The other thing we also do is we work with um, a number of schools. So last September, we launched the Ivy House Award in a number of schools. And this September, it's going into far more. But the whole idea of the Ivy House Award is it takes the essence of what we teach on the program and puts it into six formers. So, what are these skills? What are these skills that I'm talking about? Well, they're these. We call them the Ivy House Seven. And our programs clearly cover these seven core skills. But today, we're going to focus on the skill of conscious mind. And to do that, to get us started off, I have a question for you. And what I'd like you to do when I ask this question is just to tap into the chat facility, one, two, or three words that will answer this question. So the question is, how are you feeling right now? Just give us a couple of words that would describe exactly how you're feeling right now. And Tim, if you want to share some of those with me, that would be cool because I don't, I can't see the, the chat yeah, facility. Absolutely. So we've got tired, happy, lonely, isolated, exhausted, energized. A bit Groundhog Day, interested, busy, engaged, interested, grateful, cooped up, anxious, inquisitive, calm and family orientated. Yeah, excited, interested, hopeful, fatigued but curious, motivated, stuck indoors. Okay, grateful, busy, juggling, confused, a huge spectrum of different emotions coming through here. Nice. Positive. Yeah, I mean, tired, worried. From one end of the spectrum yeah. to the other, right? Absolutely. Yeah, teacher. Okay. So I have um, I have a second question for you then, and the second question is, where do you think these feelings are coming from? If you could type those answers, what's generating those feelings for you? We've got mind, head, state of mind, self, media mind trying to do too much expectations my own thoughts myself my brain experiences heart and mind myself the environment society lockdown helicopters my life unusual circumstances uncertainty weather work news doing online school situation boris johnson uncertainty it's all boris's what am I fault thinking yeah so lots about helicopters okay Furlough, yeah, insecurity. Again, lots of different uh, experiences. Cool. The helicopters are telling me that there's a lot of Ivy House delegates on this webinar right absolutely, now. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 
So why am I asking the question? The, quest the reason I'm asking is because for us to really take control of the quality of our life, first, we need to identify first what our feelings are, but secondly, understand what's generating them. And that's really going to be the focus of what we talk about today. So my aims over, um, I believe we have 45 minutes in total and then 15 minutes for questions at the end. My aims over that time is to do three things. The first is I'm going to share with you the most important equation ever. And I know we have a number of teachers on the line. Um, but, you know, even if you're a maths teacher, bear with me. This is going to be the best equation ever. Secondly, I'm going to look at the game changing skill of conscious mind. And finally, I want to look at the difference between change and transitions because they're very different things. And as I say, I'll take some questions at the end. If you want to put them on the chat as we go through, that's fine. So a big this equation up, right? The most important equation ever is E plus B equals R. So what does that stand for? It stands for event plus behavior equals result. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. Life, life is just a series of events, one event after the other. It rains, the bus is late, you can't get a haircut or your highlights done for five weeks. <laughs> that really is a crisis. Um, you pass an exam, you get a better grade than you thought you were going to get. Your exams get canceled. You get furloughed. Your parents are in a foul mood. Your partner loses their job. COVID-19 turns the world on its head. Most of these events, almost all of these events, we have absolutely no control over. None. But the thing we do have control over is how we respond to each and every one of them. So the event comes along, somebody comes into the room and shouts at you. In that moment, you have a choice. You have a choice whether or not to shout back, whether or not to storm out the room, whether or not to hit them, or whether or not to show them compassion and curiosity and try and understand what's going on for them. The event never dictates how we respond. Now, intellectually, I'm pretty sure you're all very bright people. I'm pretty sure you completely get that. That makes perfect sense. We get it on an intellectual level. So let me ask you another question. How often have you blamed something or someone else for how you're behaving? Have words like this ever come out of your mouth? Um, you make me so angry. I, uh, you are, I am, you're so frustrating. You drive me mad. You're making me sad. You're making me like this. Or something maybe like this. Of course I'm stressed, mum. I'm in the middle of exams. Of course I'm angry. Have you seen the way my boss is treating me? Of course I'm frightened. I might be losing my job. Have you ever blamed something or someone else for how you are showing up to the world? Now, I've got to tell you, I do this on a very regular basis and I can't deny the joy of blaming something outside of me for how I'm feeling. Because of course, that's, that's great, isn't it? Because that makes it not down to me. That puts my feelings in, in the realm of something out there that I have no control over. Usually my husband, poor man. But the reality is, is that I have a choice. I have a choice in that moment. And if we don't recognize that choice, we're actually giving up our power. Because choosing our behavior in the moment is our ultimate power. That's the power we have as human beings to choose what is going on for us in that moment. I want to bring this home to you. I hope you have a pen and paper handy. Um, if you haven't, just grab one because I'd like you to think about an event that maybe didn't go so well. Just write down that event. It might be a conversation you had with somebody. It might be a situation that you really didn't handle very well. What was the event? Jot it down. 
And then I want you to think about and jot down what behavior did you choose in the moment? Now, behavior is anything that you can see or hear. What behavior did you choose in the moment? And then what was the result that came out? And now I want you to take yourself back to that same event and ask yourself, what other behaviors could you have chosen in that moment? Just write them all down. What behaviors could you have chosen? And if you'd have chosen those behaviors, what, the, what result might have come? Because here's the thing, as events come to us one after the other, if we don't take the power then of choosing that behavior, we're literally giving ourselves up to the world now, lockdown, coronavirus is an event. The changing circumstances that we're all finding ourselves in is an event. And we get to choose how we respond to it. And that is our power to control the quality of our lives. So if behavior is so crucial, to understand, I guess it probably makes, it makes sense for us to spend a little bit of time then on understanding where our behavior comes from. So let's, let's look at that. Our behavior, as we know, it drives the results we get in life, comes from how we feel. And how we feel comes from how we think. Now, this is really interesting because I often, when we get to this stage in the program, people always go, well, I can't help how I think. I have no control over that and we're gonna to come to that later. But for now, I just want you to think about, let's imagine, let's imagine you were going for an interview if there was such a thing going on in the world right now. Let's imagine you were going for an interview. You could wake up in the morning and go, oh my God, this is gonna be a disaster. I'm completely underprepared. I know they've had so many applications. I, I don't have the qualifications. You know, my bum looks big in this dress that I'm gonna wear. I wish I'd bought something new. I still haven't had my highlights done. It's going to be a disaster. Now, if we think those thoughts, we're clearly going to feel stress, anxiety, maybe fear, low confidence, and behave from that place. Now, of course, we could wake up in the morning and we could think, actually, this is gonna be interesting. You know, I, this job might be interesting. I'm gonna meet a really, really interesting lady. I've heard quite a lot about her. I'm gonna enjoy asking her some questions. And you know what, if that job is right for me, then I'll get that job. So of course, with our thinking, we're generating different feeling and we will generate different behavior. Because what is actually happening here is the event is knocking up against our thinking. The event comes in and then we have some thinking about it. The thinking drives the feeling and the feeling drives the behavior and we get the results. So sort of making my really simple equation look slightly more complicated. But as the event hits our thinking, that's the point at which we can make some choices. So how we feel comes from inside us, not outside of us. So if we go back to one of the first questions, we really need to think about this. When we think about where our feelings are coming from, they're not actually coming from the events. They're not actually coming from being held in a room and locked down and allowed out for an hour's exercise. And, you know, we have five teenage girls between us in our family. <laughs> Thank God they're not all young and I'm not having to do homeschooling. But actually, my feelings are not coming from that. They're coming from the thinking that I'm generating from that event. So that's the first thing, the first point part of what I wanted to cover this afternoon, which is the equation E plus B equals R. The second part then is conscious mind and another question. If my thinking is so important, how, oh, how, oh, how do I control it? And the answer is you don't. You can't control your thinking. 
But what you do need to do is understand how it works and you need to help it work for you and not against you. And there are three ways that you can do that. The first is by understanding that you are not your thoughts. You're not your thinking. You're actually the observer of your thinking. And um, to, to bring this close to home, um, do me a favor, and um, I can see some of you actually. So I just want you to close your eyes for a moment. Get comfortable in your seat. Maybe put your feet in the floor, get your back against a nice comfortable cushion and take a really, really deep breath. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. I just want you to notice that voice in your head. Just want you to notice thoughts coming in and out. And I'm going to shut up for a moment while you do that. And as you notice those thoughts, just start to separate yourself from them slightly. Just see them over there and notice them. Notice how your mind jumps from, what the hell am I gonna cook for dinner? To did I send that email? Okay, open your eyes. The very fact that you can notice your thinking shows us that you are not your thoughts. Now, why is this important? Because sometimes our thinking really, really doesn't serve us. It really doesn't make us feel good. So knowing that we can do exactly that and separate ourselves from our thoughts is crucial. So that's the first thing we need to understand about conscious mind. We are not our thoughts. We are the observer of our thoughts. We're the awareness of our thoughts. The second thing, and this is where all the comments of helicopters and drones came in earlier, guys. The second thing we really need to be mindful of is our thought environment. Now, depending on the research you read, we have between 12 to 60,000 thoughts a day. Of course, most of them we barely notice. But we, as Ivy House, we always talk about them as mini, mini helicopters flying around all over the place, or drones. This is a picture of drones. And they fly around all over in place. Now, I want you to imagine that those helicopters or those drones are going to be affected by the people and places you hang out with. So if you have a group of friends or a family that is always looking at the negative side, is always predicting what's going to go wrong, predicting disaster, or if you have a group of friends and family that are champions and cheerleaders and are are looking on the positive side of life, that is going to affect your thought environment. Our values, our belief systems affect our thought environment. And of course, our physical state affects our thought environment. I don't know about you, but I've never woken up with a hangover. I have woken up with a hangover. I've never woken up with a hangover and gone, oh my God, it's gonna be a wonderful day today. Yes, the world is great. So if we don't look after our physical state, the thought environment we will be living in will not be as powerful as it could be. So that's the th second thing we need to be really mindful of. And the third, and I think the most important thing we need to be mindful of, is the thinking we choose to hang out with or the thoughts that we choose to focus on. Now you'll, you'll know that, you know, if we're having 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day, you know, they're just random. They come in, they come out, there's contradictory, you know, I love him, I hate him, I love him, I hate him. I'm sure all of us has at some point had a thought about, I don't know, being really angry with somebody and wanting to do them some real damage. I've often said, you know, has anyone ever had a murderous thought? But do we follow it? No, that, are we murderers? Hopefully not. I hopefully not. We're not, hopefully not doing a webinar to a group of murderers. So we might have a thought like that, but we don't need to follow it. So it's only when we give our thoughts attention that we give them meaning. Imagine for a moment that your mind is like a massive, massive dome, like a really big 
core dome and you're stood there and these thoughts are coming in and out all of the time and you have a butterfly net and you have the opportunity to reach up and grab one of these thought drones thought helicopters and bring it here and bring it close and you really start to focus on it and by focusing on it everything else sort of fades out into the distance and you give that thought meaning you make it very real and those are the thoughts we need to be mindful of now lots of us are in the habit of of picking the same thoughts all the time. Maybe something happened to you many, many years ago and you constantly go back to that story. Many of us choose thoughts about fears that we have about the future and we pull those thoughts close and we focus on those thoughts and we give them meaning and we make them feel like truths. And that, it's those thoughts, those thoughts that we choose to hang out with, the thoughts we tend to spend our time with, they're gonna determine how we feel and then determine how we behave. So making this thought, making choices around how we think, feel, behave is absolutely directly related to the quality of life. Imagine for a moment, Bill and Ben, they live on, on different sides of the same mountain and they live in tents. And Bill wakes up every morning and he goes, oh my God, I'm so lucky. I live in the fresh air. I can grow organic veg. I have no Wi-Fi. Nobody's counting me on social media. I can play my guitar loud every day. And Bill's quality of life is great. Ben wakes up every morning and goes, there is nowhere to plug in my hairdryer. There's no McDonald's locally. There's no Wi-Fi. I hate my life. His thinking drives his feeling, drives his behavior. So conscious mind then means knowing that you are not your thoughts, that you are the observer of your thoughts. It gives you the power to put distance between you and your thinking whenever you want to. And it's that ability to know that we are creating our experience of life on a minute by minute basis that gives us the power to stay in our true strength. Now, I'm not advocating, by the way, I'm not advocating no thinking. Clearly, thinking is really, really important. What I'm advocating is not getting lost in our thinking. And there's many, many different types of thinking. You know, we have focused thinking. Right now, I am very focused on thinking about the holiday I'm going to take when I can eventually go on a holiday. I'm planning where it is. I'm planning the beach. I'm planning what I'm going to wear. I'm planning the fact that I'll have probably lost two stone by then. No doubt about it. I'm very focused on that. Also, there's times when my thoughts are wandering from one thing to the other. But then sometimes there's times when my thoughts are spiraling. And I suspect this happens to most of us. And when our thoughts are spiraling, they're not helpful to us. And our thought spirals, we all have our own individual set of thought spirals, but it might sound something like this. Oh my God, I'm never gonna get all this work done. I can't get the technology to work. It's not gonna happen. Meetings, meetings over Zoom don't work. The Wi-Fi is not good enough. And, and now my boss is, now I'm not gonna get that report in on time. Or it might be, oh my God, I think I might be losing my job. What am I going to do? There's no jobs out there. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Whatever your thought spiral is. And it's at that point we need to remember that we are not our thoughts. And we have the ability, when our thought, our thinking is not serving us, to step out of it. And at Ivy House, we talk very much about stepping out into the armchair of conscious mind. And just taking a breath, just noticing that we're in a spiral and having the ability to step out of it and decide what we want to do from that position. Where do you think the best place to make decisions from is? In the spiral or the armchair? Where do you want to live? In the spiral or the armchair? And that's our choice. So I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes again. I want you to take a really, really deep breath. 
And when I say deep breath, everyone always does that a bit wrong. I want you to put your hands on your belly. The, yoga te- the yogis out there will know this. Put your hands on your belly. And when you breathe in, fill up your stomach like a football or a balloon. Just fill your air. And as you breathe out, let that balloon deflate. In and out. And I want you to notice your particular thought spiral. Just summon one up for a moment. What's your thought spiral? Just one. I'm sure we have more than one. What's yours? Bring it up. Okay. Now you've brought it up. I want you to just notice yourself. Take a step back from it in your mind. Take a step back, find the armchair, keep breathing deeply and notice the spiral that is separate to you. Now just let it wander off into the distance slightly. Just let it take, separate it more from you. And you're still breathing deeply in that armchair. Okay, you can open your eyes. So that's really the beginning of how we do conscious mind. Our first job is is to notice our feelings. If we're ever feeling anxious or stressed or angry or frustrated, if it's a feeling we're not enjoying, we can go to our thinking. And if we just calm down for a moment, we'll notice that our thinking isn't serving us particularly well. So our first job, if we want to spend less time in spirals, is to notice our feeling and notice our thinking. And then make a deal with yourself. Just say, I'm just gonna take a a break from this for a moment and connect with your breath. Research study after research study has told us that breathing deeply You can count in for four, out for five, in for five, out for six, is the most effective over and above any kind of drug we could take for calming our our, our nervous system. So what I'm gonna ask you to do then is when you notice, I'm gonna ask you to breathe and take a breath and just separate yourself from your thinking for a while. And having done that, When you're calm, you can ask yourself a question. Is there any action I need to take? Is there anything I need to do in regard to this thought spiral, in regard to this thinking? And I can tell you, I've been doing this for quite a long time and most people will tell me, do you know what, no. I was doing pretty much everything I needed to do. The only thing I actually needed to do was to stop panicking about it, stop worrying about it. But sometimes from the armchair, you might go, actually, do you know what? Yeah, I need to go and have a conversation with somebody or I need to go and do X, Y, and Z. So you can make an agreement with yourself to act and do whatever it is you need to do. And then you move on. And for me, moving on is choosing where I'm going to place my attention. Where we put our energy, where we put our focus is where the energy comes. So I I spend a lot of time on my favorite beach in my head. If ever something is overwhelming me, which happened to me earlier today when I realized I'd agreed to three different webinars in the same day, most of them were overlapping. So I'm not very good at diary management. So when I noticed that, I noticed I was starting to feel anxious. I started to breathe and I just went to my favorite beach for a few minutes and I spent a bit of time walking on it. I also spend quite a lot of time decorating a villa in the south of France, which I don't own, but I absolutely know what every bedroom is going to look like. So we can take our thinking to a place where it produces the kind of energy that we want in our bodies. And the final part of this, as I say, is repeat. Because some of these spirals, I've got to tell you, are so compelling. They drag us back in. They're like whirlwinds and they suck us back in but what we have to recognize is what i'm talking about here is the development of a new muscle 
is that muscle of being able to pull ourselves back out again and just take a breath. And you know what? Some days you could come out and you don't go back in for a few days. Some days you're back in there within 30 seconds. And you have a choice at that point, because we always have a choice, remember? You have a choice at that point. You can go, oh, sod it. Do you know what? This is just the way I am. And just a spiraler, that woman on that webinar, you know, she was just talking, it doesn't work for me. That's what you can do. It's a bit like I am with press ups. I, I'm just not a girl that can do press ups, right? Or I could have agreed to do a press up every day and then two and then three and then four, and maybe built up that muscle. And this is a muscle. This is a practice. And if you do that practice on a regular basis, actually very quickly, you'll have the feeling, your, your neural pathways will do the work that they have to do. And very quickly, you will be back in that armchair and be in that place of what I would call conscious awareness, where I can make the decisions I want to make using the right parts of my brain. So that's the second part of what I wanted to cover this afternoon, conscious mind. Very briefly then, I want to just cover the final part, which is the difference between change and transitions. Now the thing about change is change happens instantly. You know, but my husband and I were in London um, the weekend before lockdown was announced. And actually, it was quite weird when we were packing up our suitcases. We both felt like we were going back almost into a war zone. But we came back and lockdown was, was announced. And it happened like that, right? Change there. But that's not what happens to us. We go through a transition. And the reason it's important for you guys to know this is because we're often very hard on ourselves around change. But actually, it's important for us to understand the process that we go through personally. So the first thing that happens to us is we have an ending. And that ending is characterized by denial. Ah, you know, it's, it's just like the common flu or whatever it is we were saying. And, you know, it's, it's not going to happen for long. It'll only be a week or so. And, and then bargaining. Well, does that really apply to me? I certainly did an awful lot of bargaining with our middle daughter who didn't want it to apply to her not seeing her boyfriend. So there's a lot of negotiations that we have to do with ourselves and resisting, resisting change. And then we move into what, what's known as the neutral zone. And when we're in neutral, we sort of have a sad acceptance. There's a feeling of loss of what's gone before and what we might not regain for a while. We notice this a lot when relationships end and we don't want them to end. You go through your ending of anger and denial and resistance, and then you move into a stage of sad acceptance. But also within this stage of, um, of the neutral zone, is creativity. I don't know about you, but I've been blown away by the level of creativity that is going on in our country right now. And innovation, how businesses have pivoted almost beyond recognition, literally within a month. I mean, the same has happened for our business, you know. We did used to deliver all of our programs face-to-face, um, -face, but now every single one of our programs is, av is available virtually, which is incredible in a month. And as we come out of the neutral zone, we get into new beginnings. And new beginnings are characterized by exploration, vision, a commitment to a new way of being. And that's what every single one of us is going at. Some of us may still be in our ending, some of us may be in the neutral zone, and some of us may have already moved on to the new beginning. This is my favorite quote of the moment. The future is an incomplete equation by Keith Blevins. And what strikes me about this is it very much feels true right now, but I think it's always been true. The future has always been an incomplete equation. We don't have control over the future, but what we do have control over is how we spend our time in our mind. And for that reason, I'm going to give you the final gift of our talk today. I'm going to give you all a million pounds. That would make our webinars more popular, wouldn't it? I'm going to give you all a million pounds. And I'd like you to think for a moment and, and tell us on the chat, 
I'm going to give you a million pounds and you have to spend it by the end of Sunday. Have to. And let's just pretend all the shops are open. Put on the chat, what would you spend the million pounds on? Tell us what you'd spend it on. Okay, so we've got a few coming through. We've got a Tesla Model X, a holiday, a racehorse, a small business, my first house, uh, a property, a second home, uh, vaccines, okay, a new hip, support my family, animals, paying off the mortgage, diamonds, cake, <laughs> a new house, lots of dogs, okay, a big party, PPE for NHS, okay, very topical, a football team, dogs, design a new studio, deposit on my super yacht, <laughs> buy an island and the rest of charity. Well, that's a very small island. Retire, <laughs> a party, a yacht, a house in France. Okay, some great, great ideas, thoughts, very varied. So what I'm noticing then is that everybody is spending money on stuff they'd like. And of course, yeah, of course we're spending money on stuff like that. You're spending money on stuff that would make you happy. So let me ask you then, if I gave you an extra million minutes in your mind, how would you spend those? How would you spend those thinking minutes, what I call mind time? And would you spend it on thoughts that strengthen you, better equip you to cope with life, one event after the other? Or would you spend it on thoughts that weaken you and disable you, making you less able to cope? So we've got planning, thinking, planning for retirement, getting to the bottom of what I really want in the next five years, learning, family on holidays, meditation, learning and reflection, do what I've not done, reading, podcasts, connecting, connecting to the here and now, self-education, learning new skills, podcasts. Okay. That's brilliant. Be kind, being kind to myself, wow. Appreciating being alive, wow. Some really deep, uh, some deep thoughts there as well. Great. So there's a, there's a story out there, it's a fable. And uh, it starts with the idea that um, every single morning, imagine you have a bank account and every single, every single day somebody deposits 86,400 pounds in your bank account every single day. And by the end of that day, the bank account is wiped clean. You have to spend that money every single day and if you don't spend that money every single day it's gone well 86,400 is exactly the number of seconds we have in a day and every single night it's wiped clean and we start again and that's our power to choose how we spend our time how we spend our time in our mind and whether or not we choose to make it to strengthen us and make us happier or not. And that, I guess, is the principle of conscious mind. So that's the end of my presentation this afternoon. I'm really happy to take any questions. And if anyone, um, it, just type in the questions and Tim will let me know what they are. While you're doing that, um, if you want to know anything more about Ivy House, you can follow us on all of these social media platforms that exist. But for now, if there are any questions, let me know. So Elka, what I'll do is I'll start off with some questions that have been posted as we'll be moving through the presentation. So, um, so the first question was, uh, what's the key to turning off or blocking negative thoughts? That was Ria who asked that question early on. Yeah, so it's a great question. I, I suspect I may have answered it in part, but the reality is, is we, don't, we don't want to turn off negative thoughts or block them. In fact, blocking negative thoughts is quite a problem and we get into something called numbing. So uh, imagine you had a rug in your sitting room and, and rather than sweep, sweep the, the floor every day, you just shoved all the dirt under the rug and eventually we'd be tripping up over that rug. So we don't want to block negative thoughts, but having negative thoughts is part of being human. What we need to do is let them pass through us. If we leave a thought to its own devices, it'll pass through us within 60 to 90 seconds. But it's when we grab hold of them and we focus on them 
that we start to cause ourselves problems. But the minute you notice that you've done that, the minute you notice that you've grabbed hold of a thought, maybe you're going into a bit of a spiral, do exactly what I just talked about, which is stop, notice the thinking you're hanging out with, give yourself the challenge of breathing in and out for 10 breaths and focus only on the breathing. And I can tell you, you'll probably get to number two or three before you lose your concentration. If you do that, come back to one and focus, that, uh, focus your mind on that idea of separating yourself from your thinking. And then once you've done that, you move on. You, fo and, you know, one of the things the team at Ivy House do, we, we share this all the time, but you know, the best thing I can do when I find that a repetitive spiral is coming back and I focus on my breathing, I get myself into a calmer place, is I listen to podcasts, I listen to audio books, I listen to, I read articles, I remind myself that I am not my thinking. Or as I say, I go to the beach, I decorate my house. Does that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great. And Ellen has added to that. So she's actually said she, since she was a child, she writes down some of those things, screws them up in a piece of paper and throws them away, which is a, a great example there. Yeah. So I've Ben has recommended- Burning sorry. them as well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Ben has recommended Headspace as an amazing tool to be able to use. Many, many people use that. So. A couple more questions that we've got, Elka. So Janine and Vicky asked a similar question. Can we be fully aware of our, experience that of our experiences that impact behavior? And Vicky had asked the question, what about our thoughts that are ingrained? We have a bodily reaction without even thinking about it. So similar questions. So can we take the first, what, repeat the first part yeah. of that? Can we be fully aware of our experiences, of the experiences that actually impact our behaviors? I, I think the answer to that is generally no. I mean, the reality is, is that we are taking in emotions and feelings all of the time. But the reality is, is what we become aware of is the feelings that are within us. And conscious mind is about uh, taking us to a place where we become far more conscious of I'm feeling this way and therefore I'm thinking that way. And I think the second part of the question is, yeah, we do have feelings of all sorts, but they are interpreted through thought. Every feeling is interpreted through thought. So we actually, you know, I, I learned the other day, which I think is amazing, that the chemical makeup of excitement in our bodies is exactly the same as fear and apprehension. But actually some people will, will experience that as an adrenaline hit and as excitement, and some people will experience it in a different way. So we're interpreting these feelings through thought. Another question, Elke, is what if we can't choose the environment? So if there are things that are happening we can't choose, um, that influences our thoughts. How, how do we respond to that? What's the best way? So interestingly, I get a lot of this. I get a lot of this with this work we do with students um, that are saying, well, you know, I, I was working with a student actually the other day and he, we were talking about aggressor and avoidant behaviors. And he said to me, you know, my family is full of aggressors. You know, dinner time at our house is all about who can be more clever, who can, you know, dig more and beat each other down a bit more. The truth is that is hard because, you know, if you're, you're there and you're in that family, but the reality is, is you don't have to join that game. We again have the opportunity to choose how we respond to what is going on around us. The reality is, as we get into adults, actually, we have far more choice than we think we do. So, you know, we have far more choice whether or not we engage in the battles that are surrounding us or not. Um, and of course, we, we have choice about whether or not we stay in relationships or not. Great. Albert asked a great question. Um, he said, Elka spoke about finding time, a happy place on the favorite beach. How do we find our own happy spot? How's, how do we find our own happy space in life? That is, that is the, the best homework ever in the world. And um, <laughs> it's something that I have done with our kids on a number of occasions when everything's going on. The thing to do is to really start to become observant of what makes your soul sing of those moments in your life. I have what's called a love list. Things I absolutely love doing. Things that just make me happy. And whenever I have a moment, I look to, when I have a moment where I'm going feeling totally out of balance, I go to that and remind myself of all those things. And it, you don't even have to go there. Do you know the brain doesn't know the difference between whether or not you're actually on the beach or, or here standing talking to you guys or working at your desk. 
The brain doesn't know the difference. So you can take yourself where you want to go in your mind. But if you don't know where those places are, what I would suggest is you sit down in that armchair, you take a lot of deep breaths and you let your mind wander and find your place. And once you've found it, create it in technicolor. I mean, really see, for me, really see the color of the sand, hear the waves, feel the wind, feel the sun, really create it and anchor it. So the more and more you find that place and the more and more you visualize it, in fact, it's a whole different talk, but the power of visualization and how it can literally create new neural pathways in your brain. So the minute you go back to it because you've really anchored it, you get all those feelings. But the work is, is the best work ever. Sit in the armchair, think about it, think about it some more, put some more color in, put some sand in, and it's, it's brilliant. Thank you, Elka. So Petra's got a question. Elka, what is your favorite book that you would recommend? This is a gift of a question. <laughs> I can't just do one. Um, okay. This is where my mind goes blank. So stuff around thinking. Uh, Michael Neal, The Inside Out Revolution. Um, Hardwiring Happiness by Rick Hansen is a very good book, recommended to me by my sister-in-law. Um, Someone Should Have Told Us, Jack Pransky. And um, we've got our own book coming out at Ivy House. Hopefully it was supposed to be out this month, but um, hopefully um, because of COVID it's been slightly delayed, but in the next couple of months, you will be, follow us on, on Ivy House um, on LinkedIn and uh, you'll hear about when that book comes out. Okay. The other person, I mean, you know, the other person that's great to listen to actually is Michael Neal. He has a, a podcast called Caffeine for the Soul. Um, and I completely agree with the recommendation on Headspace. I'm a massive, massive Headspace fan. Fantastic, great. And we've got um, another question. So do we have other examples of how we could step outside of our spiral when those things are happening? Yeah, you can jump on a chair and do the funky chicken to the best song you've ever heard. And you think I'm joking, take the first, I'm really not. What we actually have to do is we have to break that neural pathway. We have to scratch the record. So literally standing up doing star jumps. And you know, I tell you, so I, when I had, I got divorced um, and uh, what was going on for me was I kept going back into that guilt spiral all the time. And of course, you know, I teach this stuff, right? So I'm going, okay, I have to break this neural pathway. I have to create a new neural pathway. So I said to myself, every time I go back into that guilt spiral, I'm gonna run up and down the stairs twice. And I gotta be honest, you know, so I'd go into the spiral and straight away I'd go, right, run upstairs and I might do it once or twice. And then I go, nah, I can't be asked to do that. I'm just out of it, I'm out of it. But the reality is, is the minute you move yourself physically, you're creating a different energy within your neural pathways. So moving, listening to something else, playing loud music, going for a run, actually changing your physical energy will create a, a, a friction, not a friction, but a, a shift in that pathway for you. I think there is something about the conscious practice of doing this as well. The more and more you practice this, the easier it becomes. David's given a great example, actually, of, um, of holding, a, he holds an ice cube in his fist whilst, whilst paying attention to his breathing until it melts and he can be fully connected by doing that. So uh, a great sharing there, David, that. really interesting. I've never done yeah, that, really I've never tried that. That's great. Because the reality is, is um, I think one of the most challenging things is focusing on your thinking to the count of 10 and actually getting there without writing three emails along the way, doing a shopping list and worrying about X, Y, and Z. So for me, that's a discipline, but the, the ice cube could well remind me to stay with my thinking. Okay. Um, Jane's recommended the Chimp Paradox as well, Stephen Peters, which yeah. again, a number of us have, uh, will have read that and, uh, and uh, yeah, great about the unconscious mind and how we work with that. So, okay, great. There are lots of votes for you to do the funky chicken, Elka, but I don't think we'll, uh, we'll do that now. Probably will I be house people. Uh, yeah, quite, quite possibly. Okay, great. Um, and paying attention to how fast am I breathing? Um, what's jumping at me now as I'm worrying? Um, how do we pay attention at different times of the day to set it into a routine to create a habit 
of how we work with uh, mindfulness to bring ourselves well, think, from moment to moment. I think that's a really important thing is that um, for those of you that don't meditate or for those of you that dip in and out of meditation, meditation has a cumulative effect. So you might do it one day and go, oh, that didn't have any effect on me. I'm still just as strung up as I was. But actually, if we take time to meditate every single day, in fact, I, I now meditate every single day twice. I do it the minute I wake up and in that gap between work and home. Um, but it has a cumulative effect. So what it means is when we start to have that feeling and thinking that our body is primed to go into that calm state far quicker. Great. So Elka, I think that's all of the questions that we've had posed to us so far. Some great things in the uh, comments you've been sharing with each other as well as um, having those uh, insights from Elka as well. So, so back to you, Elka. Well, now I just wanted to say goodbye to everyone and thank you all for showing up. <laughs>